vond ook uh, internationaal vragen. Ja, dat is wel een voorzitter. Ja, dus ik hoef niet alle vragen erbij te zijn. Maar ja, ik ga lekker in Oké. Welcome. Again. Uh, tonight for something completely different. Uh, we have Jim Sangwan. He is a uh, well, software guru, scrum master at, uh, at, at Philips. Actually, he used to work at uh, at Competa, and he's coming back pretty soon. <laughs> so um, he's going to tell us all about the social aspects of using Scrum, or social aspects of doing software engineering. Both. Um, yeah. Well, we start talking just about Scrum in general, and then uh, I'll take you through some anecdotes from uh, the team for this. Okay. Take it away. Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, as Reed says, I'm Jim. Uh, I've worked for Competitor um, building web apps for about three and a half years. And uh, at the moment, I'm still working for Philips as a Scrum Master and lead developer. Uh, but yeah, as we also said, I'll be coming back here in February. Uh, but mostly, I'm a geek. Um, <laughs> I'm a software and code geek, video game and beer geek. But mostly at the moment, thanks to Scrum, I'm a people and process geek. And today I'd like to talk to you about uh, how great Scrum is, not just for business, but also for the teams, for the implementers. Um, how it's built a really, really simple concept, but the results can really be uh, yeah, interesting and surprising. And that it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, it takes a lot of work to implement Scrum, and depending on the organization, you've really got to tweak it a lot. And it's very easy to get wrong. Um, but it's really cool when you do get it right. Uh, please do sub me for any questions as we've gone through. Uh, and first, yeah, look at the Agile Manifesto. Um, you value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So it's more about talking than planning. Working software over comprehensive do documentation, which is something that's quite popular with the developers I can. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And responding to change over following the plan. It's an agile methodology. It's a way of managing complex projects. And most importantly for the business, it's a way of reducing risk. Um, and you do this by being able to predict the expected amount of work that a team is going to be able to do, or that the organization is going to be able to produce. Uh, you do it by tracking the progress as work's being uh, uh, built. Uh, you can spot problems early on, and you focus on working software at every step of the game. Uh, it was originally called Rugby, uh, because teams work towards a common goal. Uh, but it was renamed to Scrum, uh, because in Rugby a Scrum happens every time the game stops and restarts, every time something goes wrong actually in Rugby, but that's not the case in Scrum. Um, just go over some quick terms. Scrum is the way of working, obviously. A sprint is a period of development. Usually it's one to three weeks. It depends on the organisation, depends on the technology stack, that kind of thing. Scrum rituals are regular ceremonies that you perform throughout the sprint. And Scrum artifacts are physical tools, usually things for managing the process. How many people here have actually worked with Scrum before? Okay. Okay, so we'll go over the roles first. Um, there's the product owner. This is the person, they usually sit on the business side, although not always. And they're responsible for maintaining the backlog of work, everything that's uh, got to be produced for a particular product or for a series of products. Um, and they set priority all the way through. They decide what the teams are going to pick up and when. Uh, they define the features of the product. Uh, this is why they usually should sit on the business side. Um, and they decide on the release dates and what goes into each release. But mostly they're responsible for the profit profitability of the product. And uh, yeah, they prioritize features according to the market value or business value. They adjust the features and the priority in every iteration as is needed. And they accept or reject the work results at the end of each sprint. 
the Scrum Master, that's my role at Phillips, uh, he's responsible for ensuring that the team can achieve their true potential in terms of velocity. He represents management of the project, and actually vice versa, I would say. Uh, he's responsible for enacting the Scrum practices, and he removes impediments for the team. He ensures that the team is fully functional and productive, and he enables close cooperation across all of the roles within the team and also without. And he shields the team from external impediments. And he's basically an enabler and facilitator for the team. He's, he's there to make sure that everything goes smoothly for them. And then we've got the team. The team's responsible for implementation, typically five to nine people. Uh, really important in Scrum is that the team should be multidisciplinary. Ideally, you should have all of the roles in the team that you require to actually produce the software or any connection. Uh, members should ideally be full-time, but there are exceptions to that, for example, database administrators, sometimes architects, uh, you know, UX people, design people, sometimes uh, they can be part-time. And for the Scrum artifacts, you've got the product backlog, and this starts out as a list of what we call epics, um, and they're always ordered in priority in terms of business value. And an example of an epic could be, we want to implement user management, for a given application. Uh, and then you've got the sprint backlog, and this is a, a list of what we call stories. And uh, stories have to fit within a sprint, and usually, or well, quite often, you'll have multiple stories fitting within a single sprint. And stories are basically small components of the epics that originally came onto the product backlog. And so an example of a story, as a user, I want to be able to create an account, so that will be part of user management. Uh, and then you've got the task board, and this is one of the uh, uh, first physical kind of tools that the team uses. Uh, and they use it to track the progress of their individual tasks as they go through uh, uh, stages of completion during the sprint. And these usually are, are much more technical in nature, and then again, smaller parts of the stories that are on the backlog. And so, for example, creating user management database tables would be part of the previous story. This is basically what a task board looks like. And usually these are physical things, you know, on a whiteboard hanging up in the room. And then the team will use uh, sticky notes and physically move them through the columns as they're working. And the stories are ordered on the board in order of priority, descending on the priority. And then uh, everything starts off to do. And then throughout the spring, all the stickies will gradually move their way across into the dumb column. And it's also always done with sticky, sticky notes? Um, yeah, some people use tools, electronic tools, to maintain the uh, task board. Usually, if they've got uh, distributed teams or multiple teams in different locations working on the same project. Um, but most Scrum implementation people will tell you that it's best to use stickies because then the team physically gets to go and move stuff, and it's it's more engaging, and, and you know it's always there in the room, it's always visible, it should be prominent. Yeah. You, so, you, you can use index cards and magnets. Um, yeah, stickies are the sure. board you see nowadays. Yeah. Well, in my team, we. Have these magnetic stickies, which are really cool. Oh, so okay. Wipe and clean, and you know, perfectly vulnerable. Cool. <laughs> and this is an example of uh, my team's current task board. <coughs> and as you can see, they're all using stickies. Uh, we've got a total of the hours here, actually, uh, for each of the tasks and each of the stories. That's the estimate. Uh, yeah, that's the estimates from the task plan. Yeah. Um, and so these, these are the hours that we feel are left for each of these stories, and then you've got the total at the top there. These are the stickies listing the stories with their um, ID from the product backlog, the number of poker points that they're worth, we'll talk about poker points in a minute, and uh, uh, yeah, the stickies just move their way through the different columns. And you'll see also that we've got these little Lego men here. Each one of these represents a member of the team, and so in the morning, as they update the task board, they'll physically place their little uh, avatar onto whichever task I, they're that, working on. That's very smart. In our organisation, uh, Certain, certain parts of the organization have started uh, to do Scrum now this right. year. And uh, the company has a clear desk policy, so it may not m make visible any identifiers of systems or pay people or whatever. So they also use avatars. Okay. This picture is this guy. <laughs> yeah, this guy works really well. So it's semi anonymous. Yeah. Um, this was all about communication, you know, a stakeholder, someone from the business, members of the team, anyone in the organisation can walk in the room and they can see exactly where you are with the stories at any one time. They can see exactly who's working on any given piece of 
uh, work. So if people from another team need to come in and um, you know get help or talk to you or whatever, um, you know it's immediately obvious exactly what's going on with each member of the team. Uh, the next artifact is the band down chart, um, and this goes hand in hand with the storyboard, uh, with the task board, and actually feeds from it. Um, and this is all about tracking your actual progress of the team uh, compared to the um, required or ideal burn down progress. And this is what it looks like. And so uh, we start off at the beginning of the sprint at the number of hours in total that's been estimated for all of the stories combined. And then you just draw your ideal burn down line to the end of the sprint. And then each morning uh, after the task board's been updated and the hours have been updated, the scrum master comes and he updates the burn down line. And so again, any, anyone, stakeholders, management, whoever, they can walk in and they can immediately say, okay, the team is uh, struggling and they're not going to make a sprint, for example. It comes really early. Again, it's all about communication. Um, and it's really important for the team as well, because this gives the team you know, a feeling of where that they are with the, with the work for the given sprint. And you get to identify problems really early, you know. It gives you something to talk about at the start of each day. Uh, the next Scrum Artifact, I, I don't often see this in uh, Scrum presentations, but I think it's really important. <coughs> and that's the definition of done for the team. And so, um, you know, in Philips, this is maintained per team, but it should be relatively similar across all the teams. You know, there's certain core things that you have to have in your definition of done. Um, but then the teams uh, will evolve with this over time, and as they experience problems on projects, and they, they, they uh, find things that, um, uh, you know, they feel should be added to the definition of done that. And basically, yeah, it's a, so it's a list of... Uh, in your team, how far is the definition of done uh, away from running in production? Um, I can actually show you it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first thing, this is pretty obvious, all of the teams have this, is the go from the tester. And uh, we need that. Uh, if the tester doesn't give a go, then the release team won't take on the code and they won't release it. And they won't take it into QA. Uh, code documentation, you know, in Scrum, code uh, documentation should be lean, um, but you still need it, and particularly in an organisation the size of Philips, because uh, our code isn't supported by us, it's supported by um, another team who are actually in India, and, uh, you know, in order for them to be able to work effectively, you do need some documentation. Uh, test scripts, these are produced by the tester who sits within the team. Um, and these are partially for him to run, <coughs> or for other people to run if he's not available. Uh, but also it's a hand over to the release team because uh, they need to repeat the test scripts in, uh, in QA uh, at every release point. Uh, the release recipe documentation, this is something that my team added because this is something that we ran into problems with as, uh, as we were going through a previous project. We discovered that we were doing... <coughs> seems a little okay. <laughs> Yeah, we discovered that we were doing code documentation, but there were a lot of steps that we were uh, performing through uh, throughout the project, you know, uh, configuration um, changes on the servers, database scripts, all of that kind of stuff. And we had huge problems moving through the release chain. In Philips, we've got uh, two dev environments, QAF, QAT, staging, and then production. And you have to be able to repeat the release recipe uh, across each stage of the, uh, of the cycle. And we found that we were constantly being pulled away from our work to support the release and the MO teams and actually getting our code running on each new server instance. So this is something that we've added. Uh, code reviews, this is something relatively new at Philips, um, but something that we find extremely valuable. <coughs> we use uh, Fisher and Crucible from Atlassian, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a really, really beautiful code review tool, it's very, very quick and easy to use. And at the moment, my team's working with an offshore team, and we're both working on the same project. It's actually a pilot for outsourced and offshore um, uh, output-based uh, scrum. And this really, really helps us with making sure that the two teams are on the same page in terms of uh, coding standards and quality. Uh, Behavior-driven design unit tests. This is also mm -hmm. something relatively new for us. That's, and that's funny. Yeah. I, mean, I, I haven't seen behavior-driven design and unit tests in Oh, it's a single phrase. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is another thing that we uh, we added ourselves that you don't see in the other teams. And you know, we noticed that okay, because this is Scrum, because it's agile, and as you go through the process, uh, requirements change. Your constant dialogue with the business, and you know, the original functional specs actually ended up being very unrepresentative of the final product. 
um, we now take it upon ourselves <coughs> to uh, update the functional specs whenever changes occur. And then this is another new one from us. Uh, we discovered also on a previous project that uh, the business actually didn't deliver the contents until just before the release date of the software. And then we ran into all sorts of problems with content being too long and <coughs> you know, all kinds of mess like that. So we now actually demand from the business every sprint uh, final master content, not translated, but just the master local content. Um, and if, if they don't give it to us, we don't like the story is done. And then it ends up costing them money. So uh, Scrum's a stick that can beat both ways, should we say? Yeah. Okay, so the Scrum Richard. Um, I'm going to run these in chronological order as you encounter them throughout the sprint. Uh, the first one that you do is the sprint planning, and this is uh, where you take the stories from the backlog, um, which have already been estimated by the teams and are ready for sprint, as they call it. And, uh, and then the teams will uh, pick the stories off the backlog in order of priority until they reach the point where um, you know it's, it's as much work as they feel that they can do within the sprint. Um, there's quite some discussion over this. At, at Philips, we talk about committing to stories. Um, but a lot of people say that you should forecast what stories you're going to be completing rather than committing because uh, it gives kind of the wrong message to the business and if things don't happen then, you know, it's not the best way of communicating this. But essentially that's the idea, you know, the stories that the team picks up off the backlog, you're saying we are, or, or we feel that we are going to complete these within the Scrum, if we're capable of doing so. And everybody has as much as input and then Scrum Master decides uh, what's correct in the initial sprint planning? No, the Scrum Master decides nothing. This is all about the team. The, the team decides. Yeah. Now, I'll talk a bit more about the Scrum Master's role a bit later on. Um, but the Scrum Master's not a manager or, uh, or a leader or such. If anyone would have a strong voice in that process, it would be the product owner. Uh, the product owner. The yeah. product owner. Well, yeah, the product owner decides. It says, look, you know, this is the thing that's most important to me. I want you to pick this up first. And the team can't just say, oh, okay, we're going to pick up item 253 because we like it. You know, that doesn't work that way. You have to pick things up in order of priority, but you only pick up as many as the team feels comfortable with committing to. Okay, and then there's the task planning. And, uh, you know, this is following the same pattern as the artifacts that we were talking about earlier. So you start with the product backlog, which has the stories on it, and then the team is responsible for breaking those stories into the individual tasks. And those are the things that you store on the, uh, uh, store on the task board, the stickies. And so literally you sit around the table and you break each uh, break each story down into tasks across all of the disciplines. So you'll see stickies on there for testing, you'll see stickies for coding, stickies for you know everything. Everything that it takes to do to actually complete those stories. The code reviews the lot. And then, uh, yeah, the Scrum Master would usually wipe the burn down board clean and then start the line off at the, uh, the total and prepare the, uh, prepare the task board ready for the sprint to begin the next day. And so basically it's all of these things that feed into the two planning meetings. So for example, if there are people sick or people on holiday from the team, then that's going to reduce the commitment uh, level of the team. Um, what's on the product backlog? How it's ordered in terms of business value? What the current product is? What technology we have to use? All of this stuff will factor into the team's decision on uh, what they pick up and how and how they break it down. And so then you have your sprint planning, which results in the sprint goal. And you have your task planning, which results in the sprint backlog, which is what you see on the task board. Okay, in the next scrum ritual, this happens every day, apart from demo day usually. Um, and basically the team stands around the task board, just as you can see here. And uh, the way we do it, first person, or actually the last person to turn up, <laughs> takes, the, uh, takes the pen. And then uh, we proceed in the clockwise way around the team, and everyone updates the, everyone else on what they've done the previous day, uh, whether they've got any impediments, things that are blocking their progress, and then they move their stickies around and they update hours and they move their little avatars and all of that kind of stuff. And this is a really, really important meeting because it pulls the team together and everyone gets their first feeling uh, for the day, okay, where are we, you know, what's going on, who's doing what. Um, you'll often get discussions here about uh, you know, people having to pair program on tasks, all of that kind of thing. And it really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the focal point of the day and from that point everyone splits off and actually starts working. And we call it a stand-up because you stand, and the idea of that is to keep it short. There should be no heavy technical discussions here. If anything gets too heavy, then uh, people say, okay, we'll take it off. You don't start discussing the impediments, but basically you just say, I'm, I'm hitting this, this problem, yeah. can somebody help me today? Yeah, exactly. And, and no more, yeah. no discussion yeah. at that point. Exactly. 
that's at least what I imagine. Yeah, sure. I haven't done. <laughs> um, and then the next uh, ritual is the Scrum of Scrums. And so, uh, like in Felix, at one point we had uh, sort of six or seven teams running concurrently. And so, uh, after all the teams have done their morning stand up internally, uh, each of the Scrum Masters will come out of the teams and have a separate meeting. And they'd up update each other and the product owner on any impediments that were going on, the progress of the team, the forecast of the sprint, are we going to make it, all of that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, basically, yeah, what, what we call an impediment is anything that takes more than 24 hours to fix. That's kind of a flexible definition. And usually any impediments that are out of, um, uh, yeah, can't be fixed by the team internally, it's the Scrum Master's responsibility to bring them into the Scrum of Scrums, and then you add them to a separate impediment board there. And then, uh, and yeah, it's the Scrum Master's responsibility to remove those impediments. Uh, the next ritual is uh, estimation. And this is where uh, the, basically the problem in the business, they produce the product backlog. And so they come up with the stories, um, perhaps with the help of the rating team or uh, architects, however they do it. Um, but until they've actually shown them to the team and explained the requirements and explained what the stories are all about, there's no estimation on how long the work is going to take. And it's the team that decides that. And so different organisations use different methods of doing this. We use poker, which I'll tell you about. Um, but basically what happens is um, the, the product owner and the business analysts and the architects usually, they explain the stories to you, they show you the wireframes, they show you the screenshots, the requirements, all of that kind of stuff. And then the team decides how heavy a piece of work this is based on complexity. And so the poker method, which is the one that we use, uh, each team member gets a deck of cards, which look like this. And each of these equates to poker points. <coughs> um, this is a completely arbitrary value system. It, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't equate to hours. It doesn't equate to effort. It's, it's just a scale. You know, might as well be apples, oranges, whatever. But the way that it works in Phillips, to you know, give you some kind of perspective, half a point might be changing the colour of the button or moving something around. And when we were in two week sprints, the average velocity was around about 15. So if you hit a 13 point card, you know, that's only just going to fit in the sprint and maybe you can take one or two small ones along with it. If, if a story came in at 20 points or above, then basically that means that the uh, product owner and the architects and the BAs have to go back to the drawing board, break it down into smaller pieces or, with the help of the team or with advice from the team, um, and get it to a size where it is actually manageable for a team to complete within a sprint. And basically the way they started at first, <coughs> when they first started implementing Scrum, they just picked a story and gave it a number of points, I believe five, something like that. And then they scaled everything out from there. And they just used that as a sort of reference point, of completely random. So you basically use these numbers as story points? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I've, I've, heard, points. I've heard situations where they, they actually estimate hours. But yeah. Yeah. It, it's just a tool. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, you know, you, you go through different um, stages of estimation. There's something that we call t-shirt sizing sessions and this usually happens before the project's begun mm -hmm. and uh, you're looking at epic scale, you know, so for example, you know, we want to have something that does this, whatever, you know, um, and then they call the teams in and people with different disciplines, architects, the whole lot. Everyone has a big discussion about it and then you have this is a three year scale. Uh, yeah, in size of t-shirts and literally you give them small, medium, large, extra large, whatever, right? And that's just a really, really rough gut estimate. And then they say from that, okay, for planning for the budgeting, okay, we reckon that's going to take 10 sprints, whatever. But it's a very, very rough level of estimation. When you come down to the story level like this, um, you're getting closer to uh, a, 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 a slightly more fine-grained level of estimation because you can say that uh, once the team's done their estimation, if you've got 15 points worth of stories, that should fit in as a two-week sprint. And then when the team actually goes and does their task planning and breaks the stories down into individual technical tasks, then you finally reach hours. And, uh, and then it's around about then that you find out if the previous estimations have gone right or wrong. But you know, it's, it's just all about being able to help the business to plan for the amount of work that's going to be done. So basically one of the things there is that every team basically starts developing its, its own values for estimations. And, yeah. and you can't 
compare the burn down board for one team with that for another? Well, you can't compare the story points. You can probably compare the, compare the hours on the task. Yeah, because the hours are what you actually measure. Yeah, and that's the most fine grained level of estimation you get in the process. But um, yeah, you can't compare story points. And actually, I've got a little story about that later on. Uh, yeah, we had some struggles with that in my team. Uh, right, so anyway, each member of the team gets this deck of cards. The BA and the architect explain the stories. You get a time box round of questions where the team gets the opportunity to uh, dive a little bit deeper into the stories, um, you know, talk to each other, okay, how are we going to implement this? You know, what systems do we have to interface with? All of that kind of stuff to help them get a better feeling for, uh, um, you know, how, many, yeah, how complex the story is. Um, and as I say, this is time box. We usually use like 10 minutes uh, per story. Uh, time box question time. And then everything stops, and all the team members have to hold up a card for what they feel uh, the story's worth. Um, and then the highest and lowest estimates have to justify their cases to the rest of the team. And then you repeat steps four and five until you reach a consensus. And some people will be happy with it, some people won't, but the idea is, is that overall, you know, the team should have a fairly good estimate of the, you know, the amount of work that they involved. Okay, then uh, the next one is the demo. This is another really important meeting, uh, particularly in really, really big organisations, because this is where the team actually, uh, all the teams come together and they show their work to the business stakeholders and to anyone and everyone, to the other teams, to themselves, to yeah, the product <coughs> teams, the whole lot. And, um, and the mantra in Scrum is invite the world to your demos. So even people who aren't involved with Scrum process or software engineering or anything, you know, anyone's welcome to come and see this. And then uh, the next one that you have is the Sprint Retrospective. And this is run by the Scrum Master and it's done internally per team. And you talk about what happened during the Sprint, what did we do right, what did we do wrong, um, things that came out of the previous retrospective, you know, things that we've newly implemented, are they working, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And you get an incredible range of uh, feedback in this. Basically we use um, yeah, yellow or green stickies for good stuff, and pink stickies for bad stuff. And usually what I do is I just get everyone to do all of their stickies straight away. So we do first negative ones and then positive ones, and then we read through them and we talk about them. And some teams, they group them into uh, you know, common themes. If lots of people have said the same thing, then they get higher priority and they get more discussion time. There's loads of different ways you can run this discussion. But the idea is, is just to get the team to think about it and to have continuous improvements in the process and the way that they work, and particularly the way that they work together. And a lot of times, uh, you will find stickies in here about the rest of the organisation and things that have gone wrong outside of the team, but mostly it's internal stuff. And then, uh, so yeah, out of this, you get a list of action points uh, for improvement. These can be simple things that you can implement. I'll give you a couple of examples later on of things that we've done. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at the complete cycle. Uh, you start off with the product backlog. What do we need to build and what order should we build it? The Sprint Backlog, what are we building now? The Daily Scrum Meeting, what did we do yesterday? What's blocking us? What are we going to do today? And then at the end of each increment, you should end up with a potentially shippable product or a piece of the product. And this is kind of one of the really most important things about Scrum because quite often, as I'm sure most of you know, software projects run out of money. And usually, if a software project runs out of money, you know there's nothing working because you know there's still stuff to do. Whatever you know, you end up with something that's basically useless and gets thrown away. Uh, but in Scrum, you should always have the most important things in terms of business value actually ready, releasable, shippable, you know, fully ready for production. And so, if the project ends early, okay, you haven't got a complete product, but you've got something you can use. Sounds like a lot of extra work. It is. <laughs> Uh, from the business perspective, you get massively reduced risk for the reason that I just mentioned. You get much more accurate planning, so they can see early if they need more money or if the project's going to be a failure. You get closer communication. <coughs> I'm sure any developers here or yeah, anyone who's seen software development projects, if, if the business sits down and decides what they want, and then someone draws up designs and then they get given to development teams to implement, the product at the end is often actually not what the business wanted, it's what they thought they wanted, but it doesn't really, it's not fit for purpose. 
in Scrum because you're constantly in communication with your stakeholders. We have uh, uh, weekly stakeholder meetings in my team. So do you have customer representatives in the team? No, they're not permanently in the team, but they're always available. And we ask them to physically come on site once a week. We're working with three weeks at the moment. Uh, once a week they come and physically sit with us, we show them things, we ask them questions, you know, they get to click around and play with stuff before it's finalised and figure out is that really what I want? And, and they're, they're given the opportunity to feed stuff back in. Um, and then they're physically there for demo days as well. Your product owner, where does he come from? Well that's a funny story. <laughs> in Philips, the product owner is in, in our in IT actually, which is far from ideal. Yeah. Um, but that's because of a really weird construction of Philips where IT actually owns the budget, <laughs> not yeah, the business. So, uh, but ideally, the product owner should come from the business owner. And, and actually, you know, the product owner is the primary stakeholder. Um, but for us, you know, we usually have multiple stakeholders within the business. Actually, on the previous projects, it was uh, unbelievable. We had two stakeholders, two, well, between two and four stakeholders who were physically uh, with us from time to time, two every week, the other two occasionally. But then behind them, they had maybe another 15, and it caused an immense mess. It really wasn't very good. Which is why they advocate having a product owner so you've got a single point of contact, a single ring of the neck, actually. Um, it gives you more flexibility, or gives the business more flexibility, should we say, if they want to change their mind halfway through, if they want to change priority, you know, they've got much more control over what's going to be done at when, and you know, what's going to be front loaded, and you know, all that stuff. And also, this is really important, the overhead spare of the projects, because in traditional waterfall projects, you know, you've got to do everything up front, you've got to do all of the designs, all of the content, all yeah. of the UX, everything, you know. You, you, just put, you spent nine months planning and three months building. Exactly. And so in this way, you know, it's spread across the whole course of the projects, and so, you know, again, the risk is reduced, because if you're spending nine months planning, you've already spent a huge amount of money. Um, whereas in this... And you've got a development team that's not, not doing anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But then in this way of working, if you want to stop halfway through, you've only lost half the year, right? That's the uh, from the team perspective, um, the team's empowered. You know, the team is self-managing. The team uh, isn't micromanaged. It absolutely shouldn't be micromanaged. The team is responsible for implementing what they commit to at the start of the spring. You know, they, they get ownership of their work. They get ownership of the product that they're building. They get more involvement. They're not just code monkeys. They're not just implementing a click model that's been uh, uh, dished out to them from design. You know, they, they get more to say about the project. And actually, what I see in my team is um, almost without fail, every single poker session or backward grooming session, uh, members of my team challenge the, the designs and the requirements, and they say we think we should do that differently. And very often, it's implemented. And this gives the team much more of a feeling of involvement and ownership and pride and you know. The people are much more engaged. A cross-discipline team gives opportunities for learning and growth. And this I also think is really important, you know. Yeah, I see that developers learn loads more about designing UX. Having testers and developers working on the same team is incredible. You know, usually it's an us and them thing and they hate each other and, you know, having them all working in the same team, you know, you, the team members see what's involved in each other's jobs. Uh, they see what they have to do, you know, they get a better understanding. People produce work better because you know the back end guys realise, oh okay, you know, it's difficult for those guys, the front end guys to implement my stuff if I do it in this way, or it's different for the testers to difficult for the testers to test if I do it like this. And you know, people just work better, much more effectively, and they learn. <coughs> Shorter lines of communication. This is within the disciplines in the team, but also between the team and the business. And you know, it really does just draw everyone together. It, it, it puts everyone uh, working on the same goal. Team identity is something that's really important, particularly for my team. <coughs> and we can build better products. But for me, the learning and the growth, that's the most important bit. So, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how <coughs> things go in my team, a couple of challenges that we face. Um, this is my little avatar from our board. And we're called uh, Team Sparta. Looks like, where's the T? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're called Team Sparta, and that says a lot about our attitude, actually. We're um, uh, kind of, um, yeah, impulsive, passionate, 
uh, yeah, a very, very driven team, a very loud team. Possibly too loud to maintain. And, uh, so yeah, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the team. <coughs> From a management perspective, our team's comprised of a Scrum Master, <coughs> a Technical Lead, two Architects, a Lead Java and ATG Developer, a Senior Java and ATG Developer who's training, uh, training up to be an Architect, one Senior Front End Dev, another Front End Dev who wants to move into Java, and he's able to do that within Scrum, because he's got teammates there he can learn with, and you know, when his work slacks off, he can pick up some of their work. We've got a content expert, as you call them, and we've got a tester who actually is the lead tester for the, for the whole Agile stream, and a business analyst. So we've got a really good mix of uh, disciplines there. For a while, we had a designer in the team, and we've got a UX guy, so uh, maybe 50% <coughs> allocated to the team. And we've got a DBA who's uh, also allocated to the team, but he's not one of the core members. So the, you know, these are some of the roles like I was talking about earlier that can be part-time, but all of these guys are full-time and uh, fully assigned. And so the team from an internal view, maybe from a team member. The Scrum Master's an enabler. The tech lead is like a, 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 a gatekeeper for quality. <clears throat> he does all of our tooling for us. He implements a fish iron crucible, all that kind of stuff. He monitors the builds, he's implemented Maven, uh, you know, he bullies people about unit tests and, you know. Uh, the architects, they come and analytical, but way too busy. They've got way too many demands on them, and this is something that they really struggle with in Scrum, because part of their role is about preparing stories for the next sprint, uh, which they're busy with a lot this time. But also they've got huge demands on them from within the team to uh, help with making decisions about implementation. Our super lead ATG developer, he's uh, incredibly productive, he's a real pillar for the team, <coughs> and he's always smiling. It doesn't matter how stressful things get, he, uh, you know, he really keeps everyone afloat. Uh, this is the other ATG developer, he's, um, he's not as much of a, a, a um, he's not as productive as the previous guy, he's a bit more uh, grounded, shall we say. And this is the guy who's training us to be an architect. But he's a really valuable personality because he does pull us back a lot of the time. You know, the, the team's got a tendency to try and do everyone's work for them. Uh, you know, if there's a problem, they just want to go and fix it. And this is one of the guys who pulls us back and says, no, you know, that's not our job. Uh, one of our senior front end guys, he's really great. But for some reason, he lacks confidence in his own abilities. There's a couple of more senior guys uh, in the other teams than him. And so, for some reason, he always kind of takes a, a bit of an underdog role. Uh, the other front end guy who's wanting to learn Java, <coughs> he's really ambitious, you know, he wants to do new stuff, he wants to learn, he's new to the team. And this is the content guy. And he's a young lad, he's 24 years old, and he came in doing content for us, he loads content, he you know, gets content from the business, he prepares XML files, it's, it's not what you call um, a heavy technical or challenging job. But he absolutely is the glue that holds the team together, you know. He can be between everyone, he slaps me on the wrists when I do stuff bad, you know. He'll shout at the business, he's, uh, you know, he'll do anything for us. And actually, this is the guy that I've recommended to replace him when I leave. When he leave. This is our tester. He's uh, very pessimistic, <laughs> as testers often are. Pessimistic and funny. I think that's a good qualities for a test. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. No, he's really great. He, uh, yeah. He looks after quality. He's always the guy who's bullying us to uh, stop the uh, uh, code freezes. And then our business analyst, who's an absolute firecracker of a girl. She, uh, you know, yeah, watch out if you get on the wrong side of you. <laughs> and this is the same team from my view, the Scrum Master. <laughs> Needs no wood. Um, where do we start from? Uh, the architects. They need representation. Oh, no, sorry, this is the tech lead. He needs representation to the business because the thing that he does is not particularly visible for the business. But it's incredibly valuable for the team. And so part of my job has been to make sure that the business sees what he's doing and that they appreciate it and that we keep the budget and he can keep doing it. The architects. Um, I find that uh, 
it takes a lot of work to get these guys with their busy schedules and everything that they have to work on. Um, you have to keep drawing them back to what the team needs right now. Uh, this is the smiley, super productive ATG guy, the uh, Java guy. You just have to keep him busy. You have to keep him challenged. If he gets bored, things get wrong. We need to feed him. Yeah, it's exactly. stuff to do. Yeah, and then give him recognition. Uh, this is the other Java developer. I had to find ways of giving him time, giving him space uh, to be able to take training from the architects and to uh, have coaching from them so that he can start moving towards his new role. This is the front-end developer who lacks confidence in his own skills. And uh, what we've been doing with him is getting him to work a lot with the offshore team. We've got some very junior front-end developers. And so he's in, uh, uh, reviewing a lot of their code and uh, you know, helping them to do stuff better. And that's a really great way of giving them confidence. Uh, this is the new guy, the front-end guy, he wants to learn Java. So yeah, he needs support in learning his new skills. And as Scrum Master, I try and find ways uh, of uh, you know, freeing up the other guys, although that's not exactly possible at the moment. Uh, which one is this? Oh, this is Matthijs, the young lad, who I recommended as Scrum Master. You know, his job isn't particularly challenging. And, you know, he's just raring to go, he, you know, he really wants to do stuff, he really wants to help the team. And so uh, yeah, I took some time, taught him some JavaScript, he's actually written some front-end code for us, he's fixed bugs, he's done testing, he's written test scripts, he's done all kinds of stuff. You know, really strong. Um, this is the uh, tester. Uh, one of the challenges that we face with him is he comes through uh, Setchan because we've actually outsourced all of our testing. And so I've had enormous battles trying to keep him in the team and, because they want to replace him because he's Dutch and he comes from a Dutch company, so in their business model is extremely expensive. Um, so yeah, I've had to spend a lot of time fighting with uh, the business and also his people at him, trying to make sure that we keep him. And then the business analyst, you just point her in the right direction and let it go. So the team dynamics, it's all about personalities. Skills and scrum are absolutely not the, in, uh, not the only important thing. Of course they're important, and generally speaking you need at least one senior person in each discipline in order to be able to be productive. But it's perfectly okay to have slightly more junior people. As long as they're able to produce work and as long as they're quick and eager to learn, the most important thing is the personalities. And everyone shouldn't be the same. You know, for every super eager content guy, you need a bit more of a down-to-earth architect who's going to, you know, balance things out. And for every smiling Java developer, you need a pessimistic tester. You need balance. Weak personalities are fine in the team, and in a very strong and driven team, you'll often find that weak personalities come out of their shell and they start to, uh, you know, exceed themselves and outperform themselves. Inclusion and communication are absolutely the most important things. People have to go on. You could have the most super duper amazing rocket scientist of a developer, but if he doesn't work well with the rest of the team, it's not good. And everyone's opinions, whether they're junior or senior, and regardless of what discipline they come from, and regardless of whether they're talking about something which is out of their normal remit, all opinions should be valued and considered and discussed. <clears throat> it may be the case that you still go with the more senior person's opinion, but it's really important for the team dynamics that people are allowed to voice their opinions and they're taken seriously. And ensuring all of this and more is the Scrum Master's job. So, what kind of people don't work? <coughs> the number one for me is a poor attitude. As I say, you, you could have the most amazing uh, technical person in the world. But if they're not engaged, if they're not committed to the team, if they're not passionate, if they're not driving themselves and the rest of the team forward, then they're basically poison. I've said that junior guys, it's okay to have them in the team, but they have to be capable <coughs> of producing work. If you get someone in who, uh, you know, just needs to learn, and actually can't produce anything towards the sprint, it's just not going to happen. Because the more senior people in the team are always busy, because there's always a deadline, a matter of weeks away. It could be one week, it could be three weeks, you know? But it's always crunch time. And so, although there's a huge amount of team co uh, communication and a large amount of knowledge bleed and people learn off each other, uh, people can't actually dedicate time to coaching and training. So this just doesn't work. <coughs> And finally, it's just not for everyone. 
some people just can't take the pace. You know, some kind of coders or, or you know people from other disciplines, they just want to be able to sit in a corner and work at their own pace and have a deadline this month's away and plug away at it. And, and they just can't handle the pressure. They can't handle the transparency. They can't handle um, the openness of Scrum. Yeah, because it's impossible to hide. But absolutely crucial. Good soft skills are an absolute must. And actually, when I first took over this team, there were two people in the team. One of them fit into this bracket, and one of them fit into this bracket. And it was one of my first tasks as the Scrum Master of the team to let those two people go, which was difficult, but it had to be done in my opinion. How much time did you get given? Um, I'd been in the team as a developer for a good couple of months, and um, yeah. One of them had been there since before me, he'd been there for maybe six or seven months, and I knew from experience and also from all the other people in the team that he just, you know, he was like a wet tissue, you know, and he really dragged the team down, he held people back, you know, all the fiery yeah. passion and everything that was in the team, he was really detrimental, and so for, for him that was a very easy, logical decision to get rid of him. Um, but for the other guy that was more difficult, you know, he was a, a, a DBA with 20 years of experience, but he wanted to start writing Java. And so he'd gone on a two-week ATG course and then he'd been pushed into the team, which was absolutely the wrong decision on the part of the management. But he was a super guy. He had an absolutely fantastic attitude. He was brilliant. He was lovely. Everyone absolutely loved him. Um, but the problem was, you know, he wasn't hurting the team, but it was really wrong for him. You know, he wasn't able to develop. He, he didn't have the time from people. You know, he, what he, he needed to do was go. He could not learn. He could Contribute. Exactly, and so he was starting to get down, you know, because yeah. he, he felt that, yeah, you know, there's this amazing team of wonderful people and everyone's producing and working towards a goal and he couldn't help, you know, and it was really beating him down. And so, you know, we had to let him go for his benefit, you know, he needed to go and work on a traditional waterfall project where you could sit with a couple of senior developers with, you know, a six month project deadline and, um, and learn, learn his trade, you know. Scrum just wasn't right for him. And that was a much harder decision. But did you start the implementation of Scrum in Philips, or, or was it already an existing thing? Yeah. Um, no, in Philips we've been doing it for, I don't know, maybe a year and four months, something like that, so not very long. Okay. And I joined maybe three months after uh, after they started doing it, or rather I joined the Scrum team maybe three months after they started doing it. So they were already so used to the so idea of what those were? Yeah, the start of this year. Um, or oh, well, well, I joined around about the start of this year, and they had been doing it for a few months before, I think. So yeah, how do you deal with this stuff? People who are struggling to fit in the team, they should first be supported and helped, <coughs> as much as the team can do so without uh, impacting velocity. If it still isn't working out, and they're slowing down the team, then, in my opinion, they should be placed elsewhere for their benefit and for the benefit of the team. So, for example, very junior people like the chap I was just talking about, who was senior DBA but super junior when it came to Java, yeah, he could really benefit from working on a waterfall project or two, you know, learn his skills and then come back and try Scrum again. Um, and then this is the guy who was the, the first one on my previous list, people who are hurting team spirit. Um, you'll usually find actually that in a strong team they'll be dealt with spontaneously by the team, you know. They'll get negative feedback in retrospectives, people will tell them, you know, that they will um, you know, the team is self-policing most of the time. And if they don't respond, then in my opinion, they should also be removed. Okay, so now onto a couple of little stories uh, about our team and stuff that's happened. Um, this is before I came to Scrum Master. I was uh, a developer in the team. And the super smiley, uh, super senior uh, Java guy who needed constant feeding, he and I uh, basically became a team of two. We had very, very different personalities, but it balanced wonderfully, and we were unbelievably productive together. But that was really bad. Because all the other devs were fading into the background, you know. We were a dual point of failure. There was very little knowledge sharing, because we were basically carrying the team on our own. And it took a lot of work for us to undo that dynamic and move back from a pair to a team. And actually, it was me moving into the Scrum Master role that really helped with that because I've basically stopped developing all together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there should be no heroes in the Scrum team. Everyone's the hero. And then at the opposite end of the spectrum, we started a new project. It's a really keen project for Philips. 
And uh, something that I really wanted to achieve was a truly multidisciplinary team. And so I started whinging and complaining at everyone, you know, really making myself a complete pain in the ass. And so we managed to get all the disciplines that I felt that we needed in the team. And that was including design, UX, the whole lot, you know, business, uh, business analysts, everything. And it was great in some way. The team owned all of our decisions. We didn't have to go out to the architects, we didn't have to wait for priority, we didn't have to wait for stuff, you know, we could deal with basically everything internally. We had super short lines of communication. Really, really good. But not everyone was full time, most notably the architects and the design and the UX people. And it became really cumbersome actually to manage and track. You know, there were too many stickies on the board, there was too much stuff going on at the same time, there were too many dependencies between people. It just got really, really difficult. And mostly, too many people means too many discussions. We had a huge amount of talking, and actually, um, you know, the amount of work that we were outputting didn't go up in, uh, in line with the number of people that we had in the team. So, yeah, uh, at the beginning I said, you know, uh, an average scrum team should be five to nine people. And I see that that really is true. Um, another thing we did, as I've said, the team was incredibly passionate, <coughs> really, really driven. And uh, we went through a lot of uh, transition phases, you know. Uh, we, we had a lot of people coming and going, you know, including the two guys that I've mentioned, and also me joining, and I replaced another front end guy, we swapped testers, you know. The team was really in flux for a very long time. And, uh, and so it was difficult for us to truly bond, you know. There was a core group of people. And the new people who came in, you know, they very, very quickly melded in and, and you know, the, 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 the team spirit stayed the same. But at the point that we finally got a really solid team and everyone was there and fully assigned and ready to go, we reached a kind of uh, passionate critical mass, you know. We, uh, you know, the, 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 the team spirit and the team identity was such that uh, we wanted to overperform. We had a very challenging product, uh, project deadline. Um, and very naively, in scrum terms, we took it upon ourselves to help the business meet the project deadline. And that's not the team's responsibility. It's the business's responsibility to do the planning, and, you know, if, if the project's going to be late, then, okay, that's the way it is, you know. In traditional waterfall, there might be an expectation for the team to do overtime, um, you know, to do crunch time to try and get the product, uh, product out the door and meet the deadline. But in scrum, that's something that's not uh, uh, sustainable, something that's not advised. But anyway, the team jointly decided to do a scene over time uh, for the sake of the project and also, you know, internally for our sake because we wanted to uh, prove ourselves, you know, we knew we were shit hot and we wanted to prove it. And so we had many pizza nights and here's our uh, burn down chart at the end of a particularly fantastic stream. And as you can see, everyone is in fairly high spirits. <coughs> Particularly, uh, you'll notice here, it's not very clear. But there's a little thing here that says the Spartan line, a little picture, and then underneath we've written, not this time. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. But yeah, we basically doubled our velocity. But, <coughs> we dropped quality. And that's one of the first reasons that over time is not advisable in any project that particularly useful. Because you're responsible for the whole chain of the story end to end. Is that you? Five minutes of coffee. Is that okay? Um, if you want to. Okay. <laughs> um, also, we got a negative reaction from the other teams. And that was something that we hadn't anticipated. You know, The other teams felt that we were raising the business's expectations unreasonably because we were basically not being fair. You know, We weren't working 40 hour weeks, we were working 60 or 70 hour weeks. Not, not fair to ourselves. Oh, also, but that was something we didn't realise at that point. Yeah. And yeah, the unrealistic stakeholder expectations actually reflected on us as well, not just the other teams. And well, more so on us, obviously, because the expectation was that we were always going to be producing at this velocity. And even though we explained to the stakeholders really clearly, look, you know, we've got extra overtime, that didn't matter. And all this contributed to another problem, but as we said, we'll come. I'll tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs>